There it is, Michigan fans. There's the performance you've been waiting for. Talking Michigan football here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We got Steve Days on the line from Michigan Podcast. And if you've heard any of his samplings here, get over to Michigan Podcast on your favorite audio platform or here on YouTube. Steve, how you doing today? A lot better than I've been in the last few weeks when you've asked me that question, Mark. Thank you. So I guess uh, the emotion, therefore the analysis I'm going to anticipate is going to be a bit mixed in that, wow, that was awesome. That was great. That felt so good. That looked so good against that team, that program. But that second half against Penn State and now this performance, where has that been and why didn't it come a little bit sooner? I'm not there yet. I want to see how this season turns out. Okay. I mean, if, if, if they do something they haven't done in a long, long time, uh, and that is uh, sweep their rivals. Then, I, I mean, if you do that, I, I could make a case it's the best season Michigan's had since the 97 national championship year. I mean, I, I would argue the, the best season Michigan has had since then was 1999. It's the last time Michigan finished in the final top five of the AP poll. And that was Tom Brady's senior year. They had to come back against Alabama in the Orange Bowl. Um, I, they didn't win the Big Ten championship that year. They even beat the Big Ten champs, Wisconsin. So lost uh, two conference games uh, and didn't win the Big Ten championship that year. So I think we have to wait and see how things turn out. Okay, now if if it turns out the way that's the most likely scenario that they win these next three games, although Indiana and Bloomington will not be easy, Hoosiers are in their best season in about thirty five years, and the last two times we've gone down there, it's been double and triple overtime. Those three games and lose to Ohio State and go nine and three. And then you win a bowl game and go 10 and three. That that seems to, which probably in that scenario would probably be like a citrus bowl. That's kind of been with the with the baseline for this program has been in the Harbaugh era is a 10 and three program. And I think, you know, you and I will have that, man, why didn't they put this thing together uh, conversation? But I think we have to wait and see how the season plays out uh, as, as Michigan fans before we do that. I responded to a commenter just a few minutes ago who was looking at the tangible aspect of the championship scenario. And of course, it's Penn State and Ohio State's to determine right now. And Michigan would seemingly, unless there's just ridiculous chaos that will not ensue, uh, is out of the championship race. And I had to bring him to light about the game, the rivalry that that in some aspects for some fan bases on either side of that Ohio State Michigan divide is bigger than winning a conference championship or maybe even a national championship so there is still something to be taken from Ohio State well if you look at big 10 championship scenarios michigan needs a three-way tie um between penn state ohio state and themselves with two losses and so they need ohio they need penn state they have to lose if penn state beats minnesota in two weeks, Michigan's that, that, that essentially eliminates Michigan, barring something nuts. If if there were to be a three-way tie at six and two, um, then you, I think at that point, actually, it goes to divisional record. And I, that because Penn State would be out by virtue of losing, uh, you know what, I'm confused. I just know this, Penn State needs to lose to somebody other than Ohio State and then lose to Ohio State. Ohio State needs to lose to somebody and then lose to Michigan it's, it's a crapshoot. It's probably, you know, it's one in a million not happening. Yeah. Too much to think about right now, especially with the way those two teams are playing and specifically Ohio state, but getting back to the Notre Dame effort, the Penn state game did not surprise me in any way, shape or form the outcome, the performance of the two teams, nothing. This game surprised me. I thought Notre Dame was, and maybe they still are uh, a legitimate top 10 end of the top 10 team. I thought this was going to be a closely, uh, fought game to the to the bitter end. I thought the one point spread was right on. I picked Notre Dame to win the game. I was not surprised that Michigan won, but I rewatched the game um, late last night, and it was a mauling. You know, Michigan had well over a three yard per play differential advantage in the game. Those are the kinds of numbers you usually put up against Rutgers, uh, Illinois. Maybe not this year, but you know, a, a Group of Five team. Uh, just flat out dominated the Irish in that game. And when you go to, to the rivalry aspect that you asked me about a minute ago, Ari Wasserman over at The Athletic put up a poll on his Twitter feed. He covers Ohio State for The Athletic. And he put up a poll on his Twitter feed last week, and he asked Ohio State fans that follow him, hey, if you had a choice between losing to Michigan but making the playoff, meaning let's say Ohio State's 11-0, and 
uh, beats Penn State that week before the Michigan game to win the East and then goes in and gets upset uh, by the Wolverines, but then goes to the Big Ten title and given their resume and winning what a lot of people think is the best conference in the country this year, gets to the playoff. Would you rather have that scenario or not making the playoff and beating Michigan? And it was like 80-20, not even close. The people that chose, they'd rather beat Michigan and not make the playoff, okay? So Michigan likes to, you know, we kind of like to pride ourselves. It's not entirely true, by the way. We're more refined and enlightened and not taking these things nearly as personal as our three rivals do. But I think you saw with Devin Bush's stomp on the uh, Sparty S last year that we kind of, th- that it, it, after, you can it, it eventually get under our skin, you know? And eventually human nature shows itself. And I think Michigan – you saw that last year was just kind of tired of Michigan State's antics. And I and I get the feeling that, at least with Michigan fans, now Michigan could feel this way as a team and just not be up to the task at the end of the year because of how good Ohio State is right now. But I think we, this might be the first time that I can remember. You know, I'm 46 years old. I wasn't a Michigan fan during the 10-year war. You know, I was a little kid, you know. Um, I became a Michigan fan in 1983. And – um, you know, it just wasn't the same with Earl Bruce. In fact, growing up for me, Iowa was a bigger game because they were one versus two one year and Hayden Fry and the exotics. And I grew up in Iowa. And so I'd come back here and visit family We had John Cooper and we owned him the way you guys own us now. I, I think we're finally now at the point that I do think, and I think ironically, it might've been what Greg Madison pulled might've been the last straw. And I, I think now we're at the point now that I do think we're willing to trade hatred with you now. I, I think I think Michigan, after 15 years of taking it, is finally at the point that Andrew is up enough now that if, if Jim Harbaugh wins only one other game the rest of the season, and it's that one, and they want to offer him a five-year extension for going eight and four, seven and five, I think fan base would sign up for it. Yeah, it's always been my perception in in being in this on this side of the rivalry and uh, changing bars with Michigan fans, uh, exchanging those. I should say that yes, the the rivalry has been more important to the Ohio State fan, and I don't know if that goes to the very origin of the rivalry and Michigan's dominance early and gaining that upper hand in terms of all time wins leader. Big Ten championship leader in all time titles that Ohio State is fan that fan base has always felt as though they they had to catch up but to underline the results of that pull at 80 to 20 split this is in the midst of ohio state dominance where mm-hmm. you think some of that 20 percent is saying yeah we hate to lose to michigan of course and they and they still understand the magnitude of the rivalry my son doesn't but the 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 magnitude of the rivalry but they're just saying we get we we missed out on the playoffs the last two years we got to get to the playoff we're killing michigan every year 15 straight years except for the one uh, 2011 game. Yeah, we'll we'll bypass that. This is not in the midst of a long, dry spell against Michigan. Right. Where we're just desperate for a win. That that speaks volumes. Well, one of the reasons so it's not just you know Michigan has a certain smugness to it. We can all be honest. I don't have a problem admitting that. <laughs> it's in my Twitter bio, for goodness sakes. Uh, but you know, Michigan prefers to approach its rivals the way uh, my. Um, uh, our 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 pet dog at home, a cat, short for Captain America. How he likes to approach the 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 dogs in the that live in the house behind us. Whenever they're all out in the backyard together, and and Cap is out there doing his business, their dogs go nuts. Okay, and he'll he'll str- he'll waddle over to the fence while they're barking and and doing and and having their histrionics. And, and and I've seen him do this multiple times, and it makes me laugh every single time. They'll be over there barking. He doesn't say anything. He just lifts his leg while they're all sitting there at the fence on the other side of it, screaming and barking and yelling at him. And he won't say anything back and he'll just lift his leg and he'll pee right on them, right on the fence. I've watched him do this several times. And then he'll just sit there and look at him and then he'll gallop back to come back in the house. Right? That is a, that's a metaphor for how Michigan <laughs> in a perfect world likes to treat its rivals. Now, now, the reality is we're one of the few schools that has three of them. Now, we're going to go into a stage here for the next 15 years. We don't have to play three rivalry games. And and when you have, you have to be very careful because if you tell everybody, hey, if we don't beat Ohio State, the season's over, you don't want to hand Michigan State any other edge, right? 
You know, and then you've got a, you were one of the few schools that has a non-conference rivalry of great magnitude with Notre Dame at the exact same time. So when you've got those three rivals and they're constantly looking for an edge, they're constantly looking for material. You have to be there is a, a caution where Michigan is concerned about wh- where to elevate one of those games over the other. But that's part of this. That's part of the the calculus for Michigan as well. Whereas for Ohio State, really the only regular uh, opponent. Again, unless you want to count Penn State now since they've joined the league, the only perennial opponent Ohio State has that it, that it believes it's in a given year is Michigan. So all of that energy and all of that angst, the Buckeyes can afford to put it all from a rivalry perspective into that one single solitary game. Michigan is hesitant to do so because it has two, other, uh, two others of those games, and if it doesn't win those before it gets to Ohio State, it takes the magnitude of that Ohio State game away. Steve Dace, Michigan Podcast. Please join him on the audio platforms that uh, all the major ones it's available and here on YouTube. So I just posted a video, Steve, talking about why the Michigan win over Notre Dame was meaningless from a tangible aspect, but very meaningful in other aspects. For you, we, we addressed the narrative in terms of the football on the field. Was it meaningful in the sense that you saw football being played by Michigan that you hope will carry forward and is meaningful in regards to how they will play these types of opponents the rest of the season? Well, that's the right question. And, you know, this was a huge win for the Big Ten because with Iowa State losing to Oklahoma State, falling out of the rankings, Cincinnati right now is the best non-conference win the league has. And if, you know, Michigan in a way did Ohio State a favor – because the league, that was one of the things working against the league last year is Iowa State's loss to Iowa was the best non-conference win that the league had. So the the question really becomes, does it, did it look like the Iowa game? You know, yeah, they won and they beat a ranked team, but let's face it, we all know that football ain't translating the rest of the season. And it looked for a while like it was going to be like that because of the weather, right? But I think if you go back and watch that game now and and – and, and then the fourth quarter, you know that scene in um, it's almost Christmas time and I'm a big Christmas slap. And one of my top 10 all-time favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life. Okay. And that scene where Violet is walking down the boulevard in that sultry dress. And she walks by George and Bert and Ernie. And, uh, they, and, and like every other man on the street, they can't help but notice. And, and, and uh, Bert, the cop, looks over at, uh, at, at George and says, after getting a look at Violet, and I gotta go see what the wife is up to. Know what I'm saying, right? I love that scene. Okay, when 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 Jimmy declined the holding penalty, Mark, when we're up 31 to seven, and in, and it's like fourth and 15, and they got a holding penalty, and he declined it just so that they could blitz that they could blitz Notre Dame's quarterback and make him run for his life one more time deep in his own territory. Mark, when he did that, I had to go see what the wife was doing. <laughs> I just That's Jimmy Harbaugh, man. And that's our guy. That's our guy. That's the guy we thought we were getting five years ago. And, and, and really, I would go back to that, that fateful day in Columbus in 2016. We have not seen very much of that man since that day. We didn't really see him at all in 2017. Came out every now and then last year. Hasn't really been around this year. In fact, he's kind of said – you know, almost Mark D'Antonio level, like when he said last, uh, after they went to four and four against Penn State, well, it could be worse. We could be two and seven. I mean, like the hitting their stride and that kind of stuff. You're like, what? This guy's like a shell of himself. But then they kept throwing the ball in the end zone. And Kirk Herbstreit talks about, I think Michigan is making a point here. Yeah. And that now, that style of play, we're going to run the ball. And and by the way, Michigan has outrushed all of its opponents this year, except um, for Wisconsin and Army because of the style of play that Army has. Um, the only time Penn State's given up 100 yards rushing and better than three yards a carry this season was against us last week. But the idea that, you, hey, we have to run the ball, you know it's coming, you can't stop it. The idea that um, defensively you solve your problems with aggression, and, they, they're, and, they're, and Don Brown has been far more flexible this season. Michigan's running more zone blitzes, more zones. Teams believe, are, are going back to those man beaters, crossing routes like they saw Indiana and Ohio State and Florida do at the end of last year, and, and those routes are not there, and they're mixing schemes and coverages a lot more. And 
that style of football that you saw on Saturday night absolutely translates the rest of the season. That looks like a team that was preseason top 10 that barely edged out Ohio State in the Cleveland Plain Dealer preseason media poll for first place, that people thought this was Harbaugh's best shot. Because now you're looking at a team that is, is is not just explosive defensively as they have been several times in, in the Harbaugh era, first under DJ Durkin and, and now under Don Brown. But now you're looking at a team that is multiple and explosive offensively when they can get it going away as well. And that's why Josh Gaddis was brought here. Josh Gaddis was brought here because what Don Brown's defense allows Michigan to do is we haven't had those – how'd you lose that game loss that you saw in years under, you know – even Lloyd Carr, who's a Hall of Fame coach, would have that Purdue loss to Jim Coletto, and you're like, how the hell do you do that? Okay. Kinds of games anymore because we just overwhelm teams defensively. If you can't athletically match up, we just blitzkrieg you. When you play Ohio State and they can match up. All right. And you can't really just have a defense for one team for, you know, in today's college football. It ain't the 70s where Woody and Bo are practicing twice a week for each other, and then it's the next three days on Indiana. Okay. So, what do you do? Well, you're gonna have to be more complimentary. And if 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 playing good defense against Ohio State means holding them to 31, then you better be able to have an offense that in a competitive game could put up 35. And that's why Josh Gaddis was brought here so that Michigan could win games. It wasn't able to just impose its will on an opponent. And we've been waiting to see that flexibility. We've been waiting to see it. We saw it in the second half against Penn State. And then you saw it, especially when the weather cleared against Notre Dame. So everything Steve just stated is duly noted to the nth degree. I will go back to the It's a Wonderful Life uh, scenario and, and let everyone else out there know that has not seen that movie the countless times that Steve and I have that uh, let's put the term sultry into the context of 19, what, 46, I believe. Yes, the movie yeah. we <laughs> yes that, that's called the church dress nowadays. Yes, indeed, yes. Or you wear that thing to a funeral, but Violet had tongues wagging when she wore that back in the day. Absolutely, absolutely. Steve, we appreciate you stopping by and laying down the law when it comes to Michigan football. You bet, man. Take care. Go Blue.